Columbus called a smart and open city. Smart, I get. We are one of the biggest college towns in America. Research and healthcare are extraordinary. Knowledge assets like Patel and Chemical Abstracts are tops in the world. And even celebrated community organizations like the Zoo, COSI, the Columbus Museum of Art, and the Columbus Metropolitan Library are all about knowledge as well. But open, what the heck does that mean? Diversity. Community engagement. Great culture. Entrepreneurs. Business support for new ideas and people that have them. Diversity. Creative culture. Entrepreneurs. Business support for new ideas and people that have them. Diversity. Diversity. Entrepreneurs. Community, Community engagement. engagement. Business support for new ideas and people that have them. Empresarios. Community engagement. Entrepreneurs. Diversity. Entrepreneurs. Creative culture. Entrepreneurs. So Columbus refreshes its pursuit of progress by supporting new ventures, new voices, and new ideas. That's smart. And yes, I get it now. That's open. Open, open for business, business. Open, open for your, your life. life. That's, That's cool. cool. That's Columbus. Some of you will recall that Rocco Landisman was in Columbus just about a year ago as part of a cross-country tour that he was making to assess the state of the arts in our country. What you may not recall, however, is that the impetus for that tour was a casual but almost instantly controversial remark he made, I believe even prior to his confirmation hearings before Congress, so as you might imagine, a bold and brazen theatrical entrepreneur, a very successful Broadway producer, was not used to accommodating his public statements to what others might consider to be politically correct speech. And as I understand it, when asked by the New York Times whether he was going to give grants everywhere in the country, or he was going to focus only on the highest quality art, Rocco riffed on the off-quoted theatrical benchmark, well, will it play in Peoria? His response was reportedly, in fact, something like, quote, I don't know if there is a theater in Peoria, for instance, but if there is, I'm guessing it's not half as good as the Goodman or the Steppenwolf, referring, of course, to the legendary Chicago theaters. Well, as this particular audience will undoubtedly appreciate, this was Rocco's Little Sisters of the Poor moment. <laughs> and as you might guess, in fairly short order, Chairman Landisman set out on his National Artworks Tour, beginning, not surprisingly, in Peoria. Just as our own President Guy made the pilgrimage to Oregon, Ohio, in order to make amends to the forgiving nuns Though, dare I say, playing the little sisters of the poor might be something of a blessing in disguise right now. But you'll excuse the digression. I'm really here simply to say that it's wonderful to see this community respond to the importance of the arts as they do to the importance of athletics. And today, you are all living proof that the arts have genuine committed champion, champions, excuse me, uh, those who are on stage and those of you out in the audience. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for our moderator, Julie Henahan, and for panelists, Rocco Landisman, Mayor Mike Coleman, Les Wexner, and Doug Kreidler to discuss the way forward, arts and economic development. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank the entire panel for being here. I know, Rocco, you've been here in Ohio for a few days now, and you've got uh, some more time ahead of you here tomorrow. 
Um, but I know everybody um, has very busy schedules. I want to thank everyone for being here. And um, I want to start off with Mr. Wexner. Um, in what ways do the arts matter to you? Well, the arts, or the arts broadly, are, are important to me. And I, uh, I was thinking about their importance as I was driving up here today. And uh, probably over time, my central focus in the community is probably the university. But you know, 25 or 30 years ago, focusing on the arts center, the arts and the arts center at the university, uh, was probably a pretty unusual choice for a business person because it would have been much more likely that I would have found my interests connected to the business school or something else. But they are, the, the arts are important. And in thinking back, I, was, I reminded myself when I was coming here, I've been on the board of the Columbus Symphony, uh, continuously been involved with the university and its arts center. Right. I've also been on the board of the Whitney Museum, the American Ballet Theater, and uh, Abigail and I are, I think, involved, I won't say significantly, but involved enough with the Royal Shakespeare. And today we're exchanging emails, so I have a meeting in two or three weeks in London with their new chairman. Uh, so the, I think the arts are important to me because that's where I spend my time. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, again, family, you know, business community are, right. are higher priorities. But uh, in taking my own inventory of where I spend time and interest, clearly the arts are important. And I think that creative free expression, uh, how it stimulates individuals to see that expression, whether it's uh, graphic expressions or theater or film, are, are very important part of our society in Columbus, very important part of uh, our lives in America. So I think it's just important. Well, I think clearly that artistic expression has uh, manifested itself in your life. Thank you. Mayor Coleman, how do the arts fit into your vision of a successful city? Well, I think the arts play a, a critical role in our city, past, present, but most importantly, I think it'll play an even more important role in the future. Uh, because I think the arts really have a, a direct tie-in into the economic vibrancy of the city of Columbus, number one. Uh, number two is that it, the arts and culture help create a unique quality of life that makes Columbus, frankly, a better place than most cities of the country. And the third thing about the arts is that it brings people together. You know, there are over 200 languages spoken in the streets of Columbus. There are over 150 nationalities all over Columbus. But the one thing that brings people together more than anything else, despite everything, is art and culture. That's the one language that everybody speaks, is art and culture. Now, the truth is that uh, when I talk about economic vibrancy, we've had in this city alone about 11,000 jobs directly tied to the arts. About $330 million of economic impact from the arts to the city of Columbus. And it gets to the bottom line too, in that in the city and the state, there's been $36 million of uh, revenue that's come from the arts and the patrons of the arts and folks who support the arts in this community. It's been a great thing for the city. And the city's role, I think, is going to expand over time. We are already engaged. Uh, we help create and we want to continue to create places where uh, arts and culture can expand and grow, like the Short North is really a, a place that is nationally known uh, about uh, how arts and economic vitality fit together. Uh, King Lincoln District, the Lincoln Theater, you know, the reason why we invested so heavily in the Lincoln Theater was, of course, to rebuild the theater, uh, a place where that was a, the heart and soul of the African American community back in the day, but also to help generate and be the catalyst for economic development in that whole area of the city of Columbus, and now we call it the King Lincoln District and the King Arts Complex and Lincoln Theater working together 
is going to transform parts of the east side. The next big area is Franklinton. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, with the city investments that's coming, uh, you're going to see an area of Franklinton flourish because it flourish in jobs, flourish in residential living, flourish in the young professionals moving and living there and artists and the creative class moving and living in that area. It's an exciting opportunity for our city and, and, uh, uh, and arts and culture is a staple in city government and in, in the city. And frankly, it's also the new frontier where we have our greatest opportunity to grow. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You've touched on a couple of themes that I think we're going to get into here a little further, economic development and a creative vibrancy in the city. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Landisman, you have many business interests that we've touched on here a little bit, but um, what are you hoping to accomplish for the arts in America by serving as chairman of the NEA? I know, a tiny question. Say, That's a very no tiny question. question. <laughs> well, a big part of my, the way I view my, my role is to raise the importance of the arts in the national discussion. That the arts be part of domestic policy of this country in a significant way, that it be part of the, what goes on in the West Wing. Uh, that it's not a frill, it's not an add-on, it's not an extra. Uh, that when you're talking about um, neighborhood revitalization, economic development, quality of life, which is a concern, I think, of, of, of all the cabinet secretaries, you're talking about, uh, talking about the arts. Uh, the mayor used a word, uh, he used it twice, vibrancy. When you bring the arts into a place, into a, into a town, a city, you're creating vibrancy, you're creating a, 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 a shift in the way that neighborhood is, is perceived. And, and one of the things we found is that uh, through a lot of research and a lot of data, um, starting with what the work that Richard Florida and others have done, is that uh, people don't follow businesses, businesses follow people. When you have a business, you want an engaged, educated, committed workforce. And the biggest determinant of that, um, that kind of workforce coming into a community, into a place, is the arts. They want to be in a place where there's you know, a, a, an active and engaged yes. arts, arts uh, community. Um, it's interesting, when, um, and I, I, I was just, we were just talking about this before, before we came on. Um, the Knight Foundation and, and Gallup organization did a poll about what makes people love where they live, what makes them feel good about the places where, where, where they are, and, of course you, and, and what makes them want to move to a certain place. And of course, you would expect the answer to be schools, healthcare, jobs. It's not what they said on this poll. Um, what, what, what they said was um, openness, mm -hmm. social offerings, and aesthetics. And those are, you know, front and center where, 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 where the arts can play. And, and, and I was talking to, to Doug and to others. One of the hallmarks of this particular community, of Columbus, is its openness. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the art scene is so, is so strong here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doug. Mm -hmm. You have a long history in the arts, and now you're balancing the interests of not just the arts, but also with the other needs of um, other nonprofits as the head of the Columbus Foundation. What do you think the arts have done well here in Columbus, and where do you think they need to improve? Well, I think they put out an, a fantastic artistic product. I'll start with that. And, you know, like with any discussion, when, you, when we have to use labels like, in this case, the arts, uh, we have to understand the broad array of organizations and efforts, individual artists, small organizations, large organizations, possibly even, I don't know to what extent the National Endowment for the Arts includes, you know, the broader components of the creative uh, sector that, that add dynamics uh, to, a, to a community's cultural life. But I, if you generalize about what they've done well, I would say first and foremost, they've been very responsive uh, financially. Uh, and while being very responsibly financially in these last few years, recalibrating their organizations to the, the financial and economic realities, um, they've changed the narrative by doing that. Because some of the concerns before were, well, okay, we, you know, we hear a consistent need for money, but what have you done to recalibrate your organizations to today's fiscal realities and tomorrow's possibly 
even more bleak fiscal realities. I think they've done an extraordinary job of recalibrating, and I think they are investment grade. So I think uh, the collaboration, secondly, uh, that they've uh, undertook uh, to work with each other, to create an atmosphere where shared services uh, are, are easily uh, uh, obtained and achieved, really important efficiencies. I know Rocco's uh, talked a lot about uh, early on in his tenure about are we overbuilt in the arts sector? Well, you know, we've answered those questions collectively as a community by some thorough analysis and a sustainability study that was done uh, that re really was without national precedent in its analysis. And it really showed the, the credibility of the story while it also showed uh, the fact that there is uh, a third less private support than our benchmark cities, a half less public support in, as our benchmark cities. And so there are needs, but they have acted responsibly, they've acted collabor collaboratively, and I think, um, again, that changed the narrative and they're in a good place. In terms of what, uh, what uh, uh, you know, needs to happen going forward, I think it's, it's more the same, but here's the danger. Having acted responsibly, having clamped down, having been conservative, um, to some extent diminishes their artistic vitality. And audience growth will come from artistic and creative vitality. And so finding now the balance, their boards, their artistic uh, directors, finding the balance between being that responsible party financially, but also um, giving the most that, uh, and, and taking risks if there's any sector that should be taking risks, it's this sector. And if there's any group of people, uh, uh, whether donors or, or patrons, that should be supporting their existence as having its primary uh, component of taking risk, it should be us and, and those sectors. So um, I'm not saying that they're not doing a good job of it, I think, but that's what's in danger. And the more the conservative they get, possibly the, the, the more audience uh, uh, will shrink. Um, and, and it'll feel like, well, see, the demand is, is diminishing, when in really it's the fact that those organizations can't put out the creative, uh, creatively vital output that uh, we all need them to. Well, in Columbus, it does seem that even with, you say, this tightening and this conservatism of, re of conserving resources, we still have some uh, really great groups that are coming up, um, groups like the Wild Goose Collective or Available Light Theater, Wonderland, all of those. But Yes, um, I, I think I share your concern about that we might get too tight and be worried about overextending again when we're ready to. Um, in uh, recent years, there seems to have been a change taking place for a more inclusive and collaborative role for the arts in communities' economic development and downtown revitalization projects, um, both here in Columbus and around the rest of the country. And Chairman Landisman, I believe you touched on this in your remarks. Um, but to what factors would you attribute this change in approach? Because I know we've all felt at times in the past, over past decades, that the arts um, haven't had a place at the table when there have been community-wide decisions being made. Well, I think you're always going to have more success where there's, where there's collaboration, when the whole community decides to, to, uh, to get something done, and then it happens. Uh, there's hardly a speech I give today wh where I don't mention the Short North District, uh, a kind of poster child for how the arts can be part of neighborhood revitalization and the rebirth of, of, of a place. Um, and that was not something that was done uh, unilaterally by one party. It was a collaborative effort. The, the thing we found over and over again is, uh, and, we, and we look in, in terms of where we fund, we try to look for metrics of success or, or, or what's likely to be more successful. And we find that there are three elements that are critical. There has to be a tradition of the arts. There has to be a certain scale of artistic activity going on that's been happening in the community. There has to be an engaged uh, private sector, individuals, foundations, corporations uh, that, that care about, uh, about the arts and are willing to step up and commit. And not, and not, not least, uh, a political structure in place that gets it, mm -hmm. that is open to that and willing to work with those other, uh, other elements. Columbus has all three of those. And that is why you, we see the success uh, we've, we've had here. And you're saying that NESCO's on we're sitting here. No, not true, <laughs> not true. Uh, what I won't say is the places we, don't, we, we find that we don't have that. 
uh, and, they, and they, are, they are numerous. But uh, if you look at, at the places that have been, you've been successful, uh, and the short North District is one, I guess Franklin is going to be next. Uh, over, the Over the Rhine District in Cincinnati is, is, a, is another, another good example. But um, when you have those elements working together, you're, you're going to have a lot more success. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Wexner, I know you've been observing the um, arts in Columbus for um, some time and have been a, a very important part of it. Is there anything that you noted in, over the years that changed that you think allowed for this more open collaboration and inclusiveness with keeping uh, the arts and part of the conversations? Well, I think there's an, an awareness you know, the, the, if you will, the collaboration that uh, allows the short north to be successful. And I think it's more than just good fortune. And if, you know, it's um, a circumstance where you get that kind of spontaneous combustion, but it isn't entirely spontaneous. I think there's a, an awareness in the business community of its importance, clearly at government. I, I also think that one of the extra ingredients that we have uh, is this university. Uh, that having a university as large as this and a university that is engaged formidably in the arts and attracts young people to the community uh, as students and keeps them here uh, as they begin their adult lives. Uh, the university as, a, as an added ingredient uh, stimulates that creative class, stimulates the interest in the arts and exploration. And I think if you, if you kept everything constant in the university and its arts center, but, but in the main, the university turned its back on the community, the community would be in a very different place. I would just add one thing to that. There, there, one of the things that's special about this particular place is the relationship of the university to the community. And, and as an outsider, when I came here last year, it became immediately apparent to me that the Wexner Center itself was, was almost a transition between the university and the, and the community. It's a community resource, mm -hmm. a very much a community resource, but also attached to the, to the, uh, to the university. Uh, I've been to a lot of big campuses um, and uh, big state universities that do not have this situation at all, not, nothing close to it. I just add to that, I agree with everything you said, but I want to expand it. Uh, it's this university, but there's a couple dozen other colleges and universities and 125,000 uh, college students in this city at any given time during the year. And uh, we are second to Boston in the number of young people that live in our city. And uh, we are now considered one of the brain magnets where young people are now staying in our city because we have, you call it open, I call it cool. <laughs> Same thing. We're, we're a cool city. And, and the young folks um, uh, in this community, we want them here. And part of our economic development strategy is trying to figure out a way what keeps our city competitive in the quality of life. And when young people stay here, uh, educated here and then remain here, uh, we have a, a larger creative class and a greater emphasis towards arts and culture in our community at the grassroots level. Uh, we have CCAD, one of the greatest uh, uh, colleges uh, of art and design in our country. We have uh, uh, several other universities and, and colleges that help add to the vibrancy. So Ohio State is our, our big gun but we have a lot of other uh, efforts on the way as well. You yeah, know, if I could just uh, add on to that. Um, <coughs> so we really have an expanded answer. That. Right, <laughs> a group answers, group answers here. Um, you know, there's an extraordinary success uh, that we're in the midst of in our community and, and the community owes less and John F. Wolf and, and the Columbus Partnership and its partners in the county and the city uh, and all the corporations in town that have supported it, uh, to, we have them to thank for it. And that is this Columbus 2020 effort, which is really harnessing, aligning, and bringing collaboration around economic development. Right. And they have some specific metrics uh, around job creation, uh, and that is 150,000 plus new jobs, and also increasing the average uh, salary uh, in, in, in Central Ohio. These are big, um, 
big goals. And I, for one, and I'm sure everybody in the audience is very thankful that they've put this kind of courageous stake in the ground as opposed to just simply saying, hey, you know, let's do better, but really a courageous stake. Well, the fact is, is we're in a race for companies, but in economic development, it's not just a race for companies, it's a race for talent. And talent has options. And so talent's gonna make its decisions of where to live based on a lot of things, including very much the quality of life, the vitality, the regeneration of a community, uh, all of which are elements that play to the strength of the arts. And so I see it, to bring it to the theme of, the, of this panel, I, I see it as being inextricably linked and both have a place to focus on the talent as well as on the companies is going to be uh, crucial. And I know that I'm not saying that as if that's not the focus, I'm just emphasizing that aspect of what they're doing. No, very good. Thank you for, for bringing up the 2020 plan. I'm gonna ask a, a good feel good question here and then I'm gonna ask one that might be a little more difficult. Um, but Columbus this summer was very fortunate to receive one of the NEA's Our Town grants and the public art project that's been designated for the funding will play a significant role in Columbus's bicentennial celebration next year. Um, I think this question is probably for everybody up here, but um, Mayor Coleman, would you like to start um, perhaps on this about talking about in what ways you see this project here in Columbus that's going to fulfill the goals of the Our Town initiative? And those are things like creative placemaking, something you've already talked about a little bit, um, well-designed, beautiful spaces that are going to improve the quality of life here in Columbus even more than it already is a fantastic place to be that's going to spur our local economy and create a unique sense of place. Well, uh, uh, the chairman could talk about our town uh, because he gave us $150,000, our community, $150,000. And you know what? That's, that's great. I mean, that's terrific because that brings other resources to the table and we've already generated some other resources as a result of that grant. And uh, what's going to happen in our city's bicentennial, which I'm really very much looking forward to, 2012 is our 200th year anniversary. And I view it as not just the time where we poke out our chest and have a little swagger about, and we need a lot of swagger in the city, about the greatness of our city. But I think it's a launching pad for the future. But what our town will do is to uh, uh, have these temporary places uh, in our downtown, like an open marketplace for art throughout the entire year of 20 2012 to further add to the vitality of the city of Columbus. And, and uh, I'm so grateful for that money. And uh, <laughs> my hand is always out for more. <laughs> yeah. it should be. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I would just um, take the opportunity to jump in on creative placemaking, and, and Rocco's been uh, fantastic at focusing in on this. And once again, you know, we have to remember where a lot of that vitality happens, and it's on the streets, and it's in small setting. It's Independence Day last weekend. It's whatever you know. These a lot of energy and vitality is coming from uh, these various places, and ultimately to an arts organization and to a community. It's, it's a question of how much creative capital are you generating? Uh, and so sometimes that more creative capital is created by small organizations or small efforts or, 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 uh, than, than they are big. And everybody's got to ask them, themselves that. But if you think about Columbus, Ohio and its basic geography, um, so what other options do we have to be a distinctive community than to focus on placemaking? <laughs> Because you know, we didn't wake up with the mountains that make our place. We didn't wake up with the, the huge lakes of the ocean to make our place. And so we make our place. And, and you know, just to give credit where credit is due, Les has had a profound impact on making our place by the exhibit of high standards architecturally, by the exhibit of high standards and everything that he's done. And that's been a really huge asset to us as we aspire to be a place of worldwide distinction. But it, if we're not making the place, if we're not focused on making the place, then you know, we, have, we start off behind some other cities. 
Well, uh, just uh, I, I, I agree and give it, I see it in another way. Uh, yes, we don't have oceans and we don't have mountains, but we're in a very neat place. We're in the population center of North America, the population center. So if you, no matter how you slice it, we're right in the middle. That's a neat place. So some of the places that have mountains and shores, they're surrounded substantially yeah. by fish and water. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so we, we have this, uh, 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 we have a very unique uh, advantage and that's where we are. And I think in that sense of place, uh, you know, whether the place is Children's Hospital, the place is the Ohio State University, the place is COSI, the place is the Columbus Museum, the place is the Short North. I think there's, a li th there's some new places, but I think the stimulation of the places, there's high schools and junior high schools and kindergartens and pre-K places, and there's flash mobs at the university. So the, there's a lot of places here, and CCAD has places, so I'm, I'm not, uh, against more places, I think, but in that sense of place, we're in a, we as a community are in a very good place, surrounded by college students, uh, surrounded by people, all of North America, we're in the center, and with our own, within our own community, uh, we have significant numbers of places, and I think recognizing them, celebrating them, using them, adding others, uh, but you know, and I'm not arguing with the creation of place, but we, prop, we'll ha we have more places in existence than we could possibly create uh, in, in, in several years. And I think getting those places even more stimulated and part of this you know, energy right. is, is not to be overlooked. And, and I guess I mean sense of place. Right. So it's not yes. the physical spaces, but the sense of place. And, and Rocco mentioned this Gallup and Knight poll that showed emotional connection as being the key driver to economic and social progress because you're invested in a community. Right. That's that kind of sense of place. There are cities, I guess we shouldn't name them, but there are cities that have lost their sense of place. And we do have them for uh, uh, it, all the reasons that Les mentioned. I, yes, I think absolutely, Doug, very clearly we do. And we have um, clearly at least three people up here who are um, going to play a central role in that continuing development of, of uh, Columbus's oh, sense four. of place. I took four. four. You want to be on? You want right. to be included? Just, okay, great. You heard it here. Great. He's got it. He's four. <laughs> By the way, this is going to be uh, broadcast at 1 o'clock on Sunday. So he's now on record on, on TV. It's four. It's four. 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 <laughs> that, that's a commitment. Oh, five. Julie. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. 1,400. Yes, thank you. Well, let's talk about something we've all been dealing with here for the last few years, and that's living in an era of increased austerity um, for businesses, for government at all levels, and for nonprofits. So how do cities like Columbus move forward with these critical economic development projects that create jobs, attract and retain the talented workforce that we need and improve our communities when there are so many competing needs. Um, is it a matter of creating the public will for it? Is it finding the right partners, all the things that we hear all the time, you need to do this, you need to do that? Or is, is it something else we haven't thought of? And if it's something else we haven't thought of, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> Who would like well, to I guess start? everybody's looking at me, huh? <laughs> um, you know, I think it's both uh, having the public will and the political will. Sometimes they're two different things. Uh, so the public will, the political will, and the right partners and collaboration. Uh, you know, we talk about austerity, uh, and we are in a time of austerity, and, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things we're doing in, in the city is recognizing there is a need to bring all those parties together. Uh, we formed a, a, a group called the Finance Review and Advisory Committee. Uh, and actually it's led by uh, someone from uh, Ohio State University. And uh, the idea of the Finance and Advisory Committee is to look at uh, ways in which you could generate uh, existing revenue or uh, new revenue to advance three great causes in our community. 
Uh, one is marketing of our city, which we need to do a lot better job of, just talking about who we are around the country. Mm -hmm. Two is helping out our social services. In times of difficulty, we have to lift up people who are disadvantaged. And the third thing is how do we advance the arts in this community with greater resources and opportunities? So we're going to look at all that, and uh, uh, the goal uh, is to come up with some recommendations, some ideas from that, that group over the next few months. My, my feeling is, uh, and I, I would echo that, 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 is that a dollar spent on the arts is one of the most effective dollars you can spend in Absolutely. any community. There was a fantastic piece of research um, by academics at the uh, University of Pennsylvania where they studied uh, two cities over a long period, 10 years, so it's a very you know, uh, credible study, uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore. They studied like communities, similar communities, where there were arts an arts presence, a cultural presence, and where there was not. When in, in neighborhoods and communities where you had the arts, three notable uh, results uh, ensued. One is um, that people who are engaged in the arts are much more likely to in, engage in other civic activities, to vote, to join other organizations, mm -hmm. that it's a powerful force for civic cohesion in a community. The arts play, play that role very well. You said it before. They bring people together. It's one thing that brings people They bring together. people together. So it's a powerful force for civic unity in, mm -hmm. a, in a community. Secondly, it's a powerful driver of, of child welfare. Where you have arts and culture, there are much demonstrably lower l l rates of, of juvenile delinquency and truancy. And finally, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a poverty fighter for all the reasons that we know, that, the, that artists and arts activity <coughs> attract people, which attract business. And, and for that reason, uh, I think it's a very, very wise uh, expenditure for, for anyone. I, I agree with uh, my colleagues. I, I have another point of view in addition. And, you know, in times of austerity, you, we see it in business, mayors seen it in government, we see it clearly at state government, yes. federal government, individually, is the, 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 uh, the shock and awe of we're in tough times and organizations, all kinds of organizations, get paralyzed by the fact that they have to go on a diet. And I, I think the notion, the, uh, there's a good thing about that, that going on a diet makes you really think about priorities, for, you know, the urgent from the important, the nice from the, the really necessary. There's a sort of a and, of and I also think, and I think there's a, a, a specific aspect about the arts mm -hmm. uh, that, that I always lobby for. I've, I've, I lobbied it when I was sat on the board of the Columbus Foundation, is that organizations that spend money all have boards, whether it's a neighborhood organization or the Columbus Foundation or the university or the University Arts Center. And those organizations that spend money have to, those boards have to make a financial commitment to give and get money. And if they don't take the responsibility for their own funding at some level, if it's a dollar a year, then we will, that's all that we can afford as individually, or we're all gonna raise $500 a year, then we spend and we think differently. And the mayor, the city went on a diet and the city has a surplus. Uh, and, and being on that diet wasn't helpful. We have, we have a surplus. Wow. That's, That's great. what I hear. <laughs> well, no the, the city is better <laughs> for the diet. And, and the notion, off. better off. Yes. And, and the notion is, I think, that in this, that I think that the arts organizations, you know, whether it's the, the National Endowment, if, if people are on those boards, don't think that they have a responsibility to think about raising money and giving money to the organization, mm -hmm. then I don't think they take their job seriously. And I, 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 you know, I've, I've argued this at the Columbus Foundation, I've argued it at arts organization, I've argued it as a trustee of the university. If the trustees of the university give time and they're not committed to give money themselves annually to its endowment, committed to raise money, then we have very little to talk about in terms of our own moral authority. And I think in this time of austerity, you know, that one of the things that the arts organizations can do is get healthier and get in a better place because they take responsibility for their own destiny. Now, 
you know, the, argu the argument we have in the university, well, who's going to, you know, it's hard to make money and raise money for the Department of Ancient Languages. Yeah, I understand that. And, and I understand that the arts organizations have that kind of tension. Uh, but, and what influenced me, and I, I share this with the audience, is one of the first people engaged with the Arts Center at Ohio State, who was an artist in residence, and that person gave time to the university, was Twyla Tharp. Yeah. And a very interesting lady, obviously a great artist. And I asked her how she thought about this, because, you know, the, you know, dance, her art, how it's supported. And she said, if, if I can't do things that have economic value, then I really am challenged. Because I don't think it's your responsibility that, that I earn a living. Now, th that's a little extreme even for me. But the fact that she, take, she took responsibility in part or substantially for what she was interested in made me feel uh, much more supportive and respected her as an artist. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's it's a real issue for arts organizations, uh, how much responsibility they take for themselves at every level, and it begins with the professionals that run them and their boards. There are also issues in, in times of scarcity that the funders have to address, and Doug alluded to this at the beginning, and you have to face it every day as a funder. Um, there's a limited amount of funds. Can you fund every organization? Can you fund every applicant? Is there some judiciousness about applying that, you know, that money? And, I, and I'm not arguing for you know, a survival of the fittest or that the marketplace will determine what's valuable and what's not valuable, but I think funders do have a responsibility to look at, look at the whole terrain and understand that they're not resources to support everyone in the ecosystem. Well, I think this conversation leads us to the next question here very, very well. Um, and I do want to say that, yes, it is true that austerity does bring some um, clarity of mission to organizations when they realize they may not have, ha they don't have at their fingertips the resources they've had in past years. But talking about the issue of money, um, a lot of times when um, organizations are asked, what do you need? The default answer is more money. We need more money. And of course, that's always um, great and it's wonderful. It's always needed and it's always put to excellent use. I, I agree, there's nothing like a nonprofit arts organization to stretch a dollar until it snaps. Mm -hmm. But um, what one thing do you want this audience to hear loud and clear from you about what else it is that's needed to help the arts thrive in Columbus? It's above and beyond money. We're gonna set money aside well, we um, issued after the uh, various studies that have been done over the years, the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Partnership jointly funded a short report. And it was, it was intention intentionally support uh, short because of this, you know, quandary about how to eat the elephant. We have to eat it one bite at a time. We offered four bites, four simple in their, their clarity, but not simple to, to achieve necessarily. And the first is to undergo unprecedented market research to enhance the earned in income because it shouldn't just be about contributed it and it should because and, and the fact is is that hasn't been done here uh, to the extent that uh, would be valuable for arts organizations so the governing committee of the Columbus Foundation agreed to support uh, the undertaking of that market research um, uh, just a few months ago and that should begin in, in October um, so that's point one. Point two is to support GCAC's um, con continued development as a leading advocate for uh, the community because it's a great place to where all the arts come together to have a common interest, uh, to be able to get behind and support their advocacy for things that uh, can make a difference, realizing that there's a balance between the point of view that's on the table for the discussion today and the other needs in the, in the community. And then the third is just simply supporting the uh, emergence of a, of a champion for the arts. And we have champions for the arts on this stage. They wouldn't be here today. And I think, again, as Sherry said, we owe them uh, a great debt of gratitude for taking the time uh, to, to stand up for the arts just by being here today, as did all of you. Um, and you have busy lives and a lot of rain and traffic. Uh, those are a lot of uh, deterrents to being here, and here we are. Uh, but that whole idea of supporting the emergence of a champion that instead of beating them down with, well, are we overbuilt or, you know, have the arts done enough, oh, da, da, da. You know what? Those questions have been answered. They have been answered. The narrative has been changed. The case is good. Welcome 
uh, a champion, you know, we want to support you uh, in your advocacy for that. Those are a couple specific steps I think we can take. Thank you. You know, pursuing that, that too is like, there's something about animals, human animals and other animals, is that what drives us is a uh, desire for more. You know, we want more space, we want more land, we want more money, we want more authority. So the kind of an operating philosophy is everybody wants more. And clearly arts organizations, universities, cities, national governments, everybody wants more. And the austerity thing says, but you have to operate on less. And I think the, uh, kind of embroidering on Doug's point of view, I think what you need is, in the arts, is more followers, more people that care about your organization, whether it's the Arts Center at Ohio State or in neighborhood theater, and you have to care about building an audience. You know, j just practical things, because in addition to the more of resource, whether it's land, money, mm -hmm. you know, place in the forest, uh, the, the, the more the things that support you and, and are the, benef the beneficiaries of the work that you do. And, and I think we can do in the community a lot better recruiting audiences and supporters and collaborators because that's how we get the leverage and, and it all becomes more important for the greater good. But, but if, again, I come back to the beginning. If you understand individually and collectively, we all want more, but there isn't more of everything for everybody. How do you, and it's more than marketing. I think it's awareness and partnering and just a lot of things that give you the opportunity to get more. So, you know, I think arts organizations are largely supported and valued by audiences. Well, and that's been one of the challenges, I think, and has been brought up in the studies about um, the uh, participation in the arts is changing, maybe not declining, but it's changing. And um, organizations are, are always being told you need to think more about how you're not only marketing, uh, which is going to remain an incredibly important um, aspect for the success of arts organizations, but what do we do differently um, for the changing artist and or arts and for the uh, changing um, way people consume the arts. So um, I think that uh, that's an ongoing conversation still. But um, I think we have time for one last question and then if we have a little time, maybe a question or two from the audience. So the last question is, um, none of you are um, managers or staff members, at least currently, of arts organizations in Columbus. Um, but many in our audience today um, are. So what one thing would you want to say to those who are here today? What would you want them to hear from you and consider as they reflect on the future of the arts in Columbus? Well, the quick answer for me is be bold. To, from my perspective, the whole point of having a subsidy, um, whether that subsidy comes from the uh, government or from uh, private sources, is that you have some protection <coughs> from the exigencies uh, or in my field of the, of the box office of, 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 of revenues. And we, you know, as Doug says, yes, we always want to encourage these or organizations to build earned income. At the same time, this is not the marketplace the, the, uh, per se. The, one of the reasons we have a national endowment for the arts is to protect those, the, those artistic activities that maybe aren't supported uh, by the marketplace per se, because they're very important too. And when you have a subsidy, you should be able to have the protection and the license and the ability to make bold choices and to do things that are more daring and perhaps less commercial. And um, I would love to see the organizations, to the extent they can, take advantage of that and make some more venturesome choices. Let's go right out. Go ahead. Mr. Uh, I think I take advantage of this moment of austerity. Uh, to reflect, and this is what we do in, in our business, I think what we're doing in the partnership, I think the university is trying to do the same thing. Is like, how do you really get close to your customer? Because if you understand your ultimate customers better, you will do a better job. And so, uh, if, to the professionals in the arts organization, say, you know, is this a time uh, uh, that's stimulated by this austerity to say, you know, I'm only going to spend 10 or 20 percent of the hours that I work in my office, but I'm going to get out on the floor 
whether it's at the institution, I'm going to get out amongst the customers and really learn how I can do a better job. Because sitting in my office and worrying won't produce anything. And, and I think that the, uh, there, there's something very tangible about taking advantage of tough times and really understanding your consumer. You understand your product. We think we do. I think the university understands what it's selling, the product that it produces in terms of education. I say, do we really understand what students need and what students want? Or are we fiddling with the budget and saying, woe is me? And again, in a, you'd say, well, it's easy for you to say in a business environment. And it's like, yeah, it is. But difficult, easy for me to say. Hard medicine to tell people is like, get the hell out of the office and get into the stores. Understand why you're having a, tr a problem, whether it's funders, audiences, customers, suppliers, but get to get after the root issues. And I, I think, uh, and I'm not, be I'm, I'm not close enough to know what everybody does here, but I'm close enough to understand in human nature, people turn inward rather than outward, and they spend a lot of time wondering, well, you know, why God has done this to them, or the circumstance, rather than taking charge of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mayor Coleman. Well, I think during this time, there needs to be a setting of priorities and a greater focus, with the understanding that, in my view, arts and culture is the new frontier of our community. It is our greatest opportunity to do great things. And, and you could be focused, you could look at priorities and, and understand the austere times that we live in, but at the same time, we need to have a greater aspiration in this community uh, uh, as well. Uh, oftentimes, I think in Columbus, we're, we're often modest people. Uh, it's the Midwestern thing. It's the do. Midwestern thing, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's our work value and our work ethic mm -hmm. that we have in this community, but we have so much to offer. Uh, our country and, and this region, and, and, and I think, you know, I call it swagger, uh, but we need to have a little bit more swagger uh, with a lot of aspiration, but focus with focus and setting our priorities are important at that, in that regard. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's time to poke our chest out a little bit. And, and what I find is, and when, well, I, that's how I feel. Uh, I, what I find is when you're able to talk about yourself and the successes you have, it brings additional success. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a natural progression. Short North is, a, is the postcard for how economic development and arts have come together. Using that model, we're focused on King Lincoln, we're focused on Franklin and other areas to create this sense of place. Uh, so uh, all these things I think need to come together, and it is the new frontier of the city of Columbus. Thank you. Don? Well, I have to admit that both before this event and now, I feel sort of like I've won a drawing uh, for the designated fans seat uh, on stage uh, with folks that have clearly demonstrated success in what they've done uh, uh, publicly, privately, in business, in public sector. Uh, and so I, I just want to say, first of all, how much I appreciate their presence, their contribution, their participation today. Um, at the same time, you may feel like you came for us, but I think um, I can say that all of us feel like we came for you. And I, you know, I just hope that you, um, I really just hope that you sort of feel the love, if you will, because <laughs> you know, not only uh, this way, but um, you know, across the aisles too. Uh, that what all you came out uh, to celebrate uh, by being here. Uh, you are an impressive um, uh, group and uh, engaged in an impressive pursuit of something very important for our community. So uh, to specifically answer your question um, about the arts professionals in the audience, um, I would just say I want to be reassuring. I am extraordinarily proud of the arts professionals in this community. The job that's been done specifically over the last few years has been extraordinary around collaboration, recalibrating, and so forth. You have the wisdom, the ingenuity, the resourcefulness, you've displayed it. So please have the confidence that you have a good story to tell. 
and we know that it's tough to wake up every morning and have to retell it and you gain fans and, and participants and supporters one at a time. But the fact is, is you are the creative engine for the economy here and you have a huge role to play, a hugely important role to play that's been reaffirmed here tonight, today and go forth with a boost of confidence of how important it is to all of us, to the mainstream economic development efforts and to each other across the aisle as well as to us here on stage. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Doug, something you said a couple of times resonated with me is that we've, we've told this story. We've provided these, these explanations and reasons why the arts are important to us economically, culturally, educationally, all of the things that we know that are important um, that sustain and support um, our civilizations. Well, I would say to that that there are civilizations that have come and gone. There are governments that have risen and fallen. There are all sorts of things that have passed over that through the centuries and the millennia and the arts are still here. So I think we should all hold that to heart and remember that. And the arts are what we remember about those cultures. That's right. <laughs> They're gone, but their art is still here. Right. I want to thank again our panelists for joining us this afternoon for this very... <laughs>